good afternoon everybody and welcome to the second half of the fourth day of the six day workshop so this session will be conducted by dr uh, abhishek datta from he is from east tech turkey izmir institute of technology and he'll be talking about conjugate heat, heat transfer in an enclosed domain so you can have an ice breaking session with dr datta so hello everyone uh, uh, so i just wanted to know that uh, uh, if you have any uh, i don't know if you have any prior knowledge of uh, conjugated heat transfer have you studied something in your uh, in your uh, in your um, uh, sessions you know in the university uh, so maybe maybe i can ask uh, the one who says yes uh, what what have you learned in the in the basic thing what is about conjugated heat transfer i mean of course it is very basic thing it's not nothing super science but uh, what is the what is the main reason that we study conjugated heat transfer maybe that is more clear and please try to avoid looking at your at uh, uh, at uh, internet for asking answering questions you know because that's the problem of online teaching these days or online uh, seminars just tell from your mind actually what what do what do you think what what is the necessity for this yeah actually as per my experience uh, the when someone say conjugate heat transfer it's basically uh, it's basically how the heat is how the air is going to interact with the heating surface the physics behind those things yeah the physics behind those things is is definitely uh, important i agree with you that is actually the very the most important thing but also mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about conjugated there is this uh, this term uh, conjugated you know this conjugated term is the most critical one and yes. that means that there is a combination of more than one heating uh, mode of heating right this is the yeah. the main reason and how we interact with this mode uh, so you guys are are young students and i i suggest you that uh, look into this because there is still some knowledge gap on these areas you know there is still some knowledge gap a lot of research gap is there in this conjugated heat transfer phenomenon although it is a very important one i'll show you with one example in my slides in my presentation uh, about this uh, it is just one i mean i i myself have started working very recently only on uh, very recently on conjugated just 7 months i think 6 7 months so i'm not an expert in the field at all in any case in, in any level uh, and hence i i'm always looking things at a very different perspective all the time and i see that a lot of research gaps are there and things like that so uh, we will not have too much time to discuss about the research gaps uh, as you know the session is also limited and my knowledge is also limited uh, to be very honest with you all but at least i'll show you some uh, ideas i'll show you some some pointers that could be uh, your your uh, could uh, drive your thinking actually so that would be interesting uh, so yeah it is a, the what you said is very important the physics is very important you have to first understand the physics for any any numerical problem uh, we are actually in fact solving physics problem you know this is the the whole point of heat transfer mass transfer fluid mechanics or rather transport phenomena in general is actually physics problems these are actually physics problems and there is some chemistry that adds up into that when we do some chemical reactions otherwise it's purely uh, advanced physics problems so yeah that's definitely the the case um so just to also know you all uh, are you all from iit bombay or you are from other institutes of india iit kharagpur okay nice so you are from different uh, different uh, iits and different institutes of india and you have registered for this uh, uh, the whole session so how have you been experiencing so far and are you all uh, open for enthusiasts i believe that you are you are going to take up open form right in my presentation there is no open form but uh, we have a, a demonstration session so the whole point is all, again showing something in in a very standardized software and then eventually uh, sending it to open form so you are you are all going to be uh, 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 working in open form in the in the near future or what's your plan i mean what is the motivation for you to join these sessions uh i see that you are working on uh, learning open form from scratch nikita excellent very good sharif zaman says that both open form python okay uh, be aware that python uh, is a can be added as an additional tool right so for all the processing for all the net uh, the analysis you can add python to the open form so that is also very good of course 
uh, use it for research purpose by com comparing CFD output with practical or other calculation? Yes, definitely. Uh, be aware that CFD is not always the, the ultimate uh, uh, answer uh, because CFD is all about numerical research. Uh, I personally try to work on analytical solutions as well because analytical solutions are the, the you know, the result ultima, as they say. But the problem is that analytical solutions are very limited. So if you can at least find out uh, approximate analytical solutions, I think I, one of my or two of my slides have that, uh, you should be able to uh, also encourage yourself to focus on this analytical, uh, approximate analytical, if not accurate analytical or uh, correct analytical, at least approximate analytical solutions. These are very important because often uh, you get nice pictures, nice results, but are those results correct? And how much your practical uh, results can give the correct solution? That's also, I mean, you have all started, as I see, with a lot of enthusiasm, uh, which is very good, by the way. But be aware that the experimental uh, works always have a limitation. Means you cannot you cannot bring the reality, you know, in in your in your lab or in your pilot scale, whatever you are doing. So there will be always a gap between CFD or numerical work. And experimental work. So that big gap is where you bridge it through an analytical solution. So that's basically the idea. You bridge the, the gap of experimental and the numerical one with the analytical or at least approximate analytical. That's basically the, uh, the goal actually. So I always encourage even my students, I encourage to use uh, uh, at least analytical or approximate analytical procedures to ensure that the answer is uh, the CFD answer or the numerical answer is, is correct. So guys, uh, hello everyone again, once more. Uh, welcome to uh, the presentation of uh, understanding conjugated heat transfer. So I wrote this word understanding uh, because I'm also in the same process of understanding this and uh, I am not uh, a, an expert in this field. Take years to be an expert on this field, of course. So um, I come from the Izmir Institute of Technology. Uh, as you can see, it's written in Turkish, but doesn't matter. Izmir Institute of Technology. I am an associate professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Also, I have uh, associated affiliations with the Department of Energy Engineering and Computational Science and Engineering as well. Uh, we will be talking about uh, conjugated heat transfer uh, in the in the aspect of some fundamentals, uh, some not so fundamentals, and the progresses and the challenges. These are of course my challenges, and I. I assume that this will also be your challenges as well if you take on this topic in the in the near future with your with your research and uh, and uh, developmental activities. Okay, so uh, yeah, as usual, the typical drill of any presentation is to let you know what I'm going to present, and uh, this presentation is is uh, divided into some topics or some aspects here. Uh, we are going through the un, uh, the linear and the nonlinear aspects of heat transfer. We'll try to see what they are, and uh, then we'll talk about the physics of conjugated heat transfer. Uh, then some, as I said, some with a bracket, which means that there are no complete list of analytical solutions for different aspects of conjugated heat transfer. So there are only some solutions that are available, and uh, so this uh, this this will be also discussed with you. And uh, the example case of one practical application of conjugated heat transfer, I found it mm, uh, very easily explainable paper and which is very important. You know, when you are starting with something uh, which is more uh, complicated as, as this kind of topic, it is always best to start with something very easy uh, rather than start with something very complicated and wasting your time and energy trying to understand that topic. Uh, then we'll talk about the recent, uh, discuss about the recent progresses about uh, the heat transfer and some challenges which are in CHT or conjugated heat transfer. Okay, uh, so here, uh, as you see, the the, the whole uh, story of heat transfer is actually not a very very new topic. Uh, it was it was something uh, of a it was something that bothered people long back. You know, almost uh, two hundred years ago, uh, Joseph Fourier. He actually uh, gave this heat transfer theory. We all know by now what is it, which is called the Fourier's law. And uh, this this came into existence uh, along with uh, the Bayot's, uh, John Baptiste Bayot. He was a pioneer as well, uh, who, who did some experiments to understand the 
to lay the foundation of the thermal conductivity. So uh, this is uh, when we say about heat transfer, we include the process of heat conduction. We also include the process of heat convection and also we include the process of heat radiation. Be aware that heat transfer is not just only heat conduction, but I'm just informing you this just to just to let you know that these are some important people you know these are some so-called gurus of this of these topics and we need to keep their keep in mind of, about them so uh, again uh, heat transfer is 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 basically a, a physical problem as one of you uh, paritosh also rightly mentioned it's a physical problem but also it has its uh, it has its um, it has its basis in thermodynamics and it basically explains how the thermal energy, so that's very important, how the thermal energy is transmitted. It is all about the energy. The energy is in the in the form of the heat. So it's a heat energy, which is transmitted from, uh, from uh, one uh, material to the other, either through another material or through no material. So it could be a medium, which can be completely air. So that is the, the whole point about it, okay? Uh, so the basis of, again, this heat transfer can also be can also be uh, can also be regarded to uh, Rudolf Peirce and David Bohm, uh, who uh, who gave this uh, this uh, phonon theory. I, I guess you if you don't know you can Google it later after my after my presentation. What is phonon theory? I think I have may have a, some one slide later. I can show you also. It's a very interesting uh, 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 point, which basically the phonon theory is. Uh, is is not uh, is is not a new thing as well, but they are basically a it's a quantum physics topic. You know, it's it's a way uh, the particles are basically used to um, uh, the particles are are this phonon theory is actually the way in which you know to model the so called uh, lattice vibrations. That's basically what is mentioned here, the lattice vibration and 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 uh, this phonon is nothing but a packet of of uh, discrete energy and. Uh, Basically, when it travels, you know, the phonons are basically vibrating. And once it vibrates, it's, it's the energy is transmitted from one to the other. So it's a, it's a um, uh, keep in mind that these phonons can, can interact with particles. Uh, it can interact with particles uh, which are, uh, that are associated with other quantum uh, fields, uh, such as photons. So do not confuse phonon with photon. Photon is different. And, and uh, uh, the photons are nothing but the quantums of the electromagnetic field. So this is the very basic background of, of, of or the basic understanding from where this heat energy, the whole topic of heat energy came about. And uh, it, is, it is important while we discuss this uh, thing that we, uh, that we understand that the, the, the basis is basically the phonon theory. Uh, so uh, now we come to the very standard definitions and these mathematical expressions all about the the two aspects of heat transfer. I mentioned there is a linear heat transfer. I don't know if you have, if you have, if your teachers have told you this in the in your classes already, or you might have also seen from the books and so on. So heat transfer is is basically uh, that can be divided into into two aspects. One is the linear heat transfer and the nonlinear heat transfer. So let us first look into what is the linear heat transfer. Uh, we are not we have not got into the conjugated heat transfer yet and huh? we are only looking at the linear heat transfer uh, as of now so the linear heat transfer is is based on again fourier as i just mentioned uh, a few seconds ago uh, fourier's law of heat conduction which states that the heat flux is directly the heat flux in this case the q is directly proportional to the negative negative of the temperature gradient the temperature gradient can be expressed in terms of dt over dx. If it is in one dimension, if it is in multiple dimension, just advise it and so on. So uh, while this is directly proportional, there is also when we bring it in an equation format, you already know by now that the proportionality constant is nothing but uh, in this case a k and that can be attributed to the thermal conductivity of the material itself that we are talking of. So where we are doing the conduction, where we are seeing the conduction, the thermal conductivity is referring to that. So in terms of um, in terms of uh, mathematical expression, uh, this is basically Q equals minus K, since I said it's negative, uh, minus K dt over dx. You can uh, ask yourself why it is negative. It's a very important uh, question as well. Why it is negative? Why the heat transfer is in negatively proportional to the temperature gradient? This is something that you should be clear from your side as well, because these are very fundamental and very basics. Uh, so mathematically, heat flux is proportional, negatively, of course. Uh, the common uh, isotropic and inhomogeneous materials under normal conditions, and it is 
valid within a specified temperature range. This is very important that it is valid within a specified temperature range. Okay, this is these are the three important aspects of this equation: the linear heat transfer, and you can already see the linearity. You can see that it's a more or less a linear relation, more or less a linear relation that it can it can uh, um, explain the or it can uh, give the relation with the temperature gradient and the thermal conductivity of the material. Now then, what is nonlinear? Obviously, when the linear comes, you have you come up with the second question: what is nonlinear? And nonlinear is, as I have mentioned here, it is the mode of heat conduction characterized by a deviation from the linear relation between the transfer uh, heat transfer and the temperature gradient. So that is very interesting now. So what I'm saying here is that the heat transfer, the heat transfer is no longer a linear relation, no longer can be expressed by a linear relation, but it is typically expressed as a nonlinear relation, whereby now there are two important terms that comes into the picture. One is this time variation, the temporal variation, as well as this hyperbolic term. So this, uh, this, these two terms, these two terms uh, bring about the nonlinearity. That's the mathematical aspect, of course. So in case of nonlinear heat transfer, the relationship between the heat transfer, uh, the, the, sorry, the heat flux, the Q, which I've already seen in the last slide, and the temperature gradient and other relevant parameters, a little bit more complex, and they are not non, they are not proportional to each other directly, and uh, they are not also having a direct time dependent behavior. So. Uh, in this uh, in this situation, uh, you may ask yourself that where is this nonlinear uh, where is this nonlinear relation uh, happens? Where is this nonlinear relation can occur? It's a very important question. So uh, these nonlinearities are actually uh, the most common, to be honest, the most common one. Uh, for example. When you have, I don't know if you have heard about uh, the topic called thermal runaway. I, maybe you have not yet heard about it. Thermal runaway are the situations where uh, something disaster is going to happen in a in a company, in a in a factory, uh, in a chemical factory, or in a factory where there is some energy uh, calculations, in energy um, production involved, uh, things things like that. So it's an energetic process. Let's put it like that in a more easier way in an industrial setting. Uh, thermal runaways are are very are very uh, common actually very common and so these nonlinearities can lead to phenomena these nonlinearities that the nonlinearity non that I just mentioned to you here it can lead to phenomena where there's rapid temperature change can happen and in this case this rapid temperature change is nothing but a thermal runaway where suddenly temperature went very high for example the huge accident that uh, happened in the, you know, the Bhopal gas tragedy. We all remember that uh, very well. We should not forget what happened in, in such a tragedy where uh, there was an extreme thermal runaway. And of course, the radiation. The radiation was also a very danger and it killed a lot of people for many, many years after that uh, situation happened. Anyways, so uh, this nonlinearity can lead to phenomena such as thermal runaway. It can lead to temperature dependent material properties and transient effects that typically that cannot be captured by linear effects. So this is this is a li li linear and a way. So keep in mind that nonlinearity non is an equally important aspect of linear heat transfer. And this nonlinearity is actually more relevant for the industrial point of view. So if I want to give you a summary, if I want to summarize everything, uh, I would say that a linear heat transfer assumes uh, you may say a linear behavior in the governing equation and the material properties. Let's put it like that. Uh, while the nonlinear, uh, the, the nonlinear heat transfer uh, basically uh, takes uh, takes into account the deviations from this uh, temperature temperature that happens due to uh, temperature dependent properties, boundary conditions, uh, phase change, uh, or the radiation effects, which I just mentioned with the with the Bhopal gas tragedy. So these are these are these are uh, important uh, factors to realize that there is a nonlinearity aspect of the heat transfer and not always do you get a linear relation. So having said this, we are now going directly deep into the, or at least going into the understanding of, as I said, it's a, it's not an in-depth study, but an understanding. So we are now going into the conjugated heat transfer, trying to understand now what exactly this means. So um, we, we come to the, the definition the first thing will be to understand what the conjugated uh, heat transfer is. And uh, the conjugated heat transfer involves the simultaneous 
simultaneous, so one along with the other, simultaneous, consideration of heat conduction in solids and heat convection in adjacent fluids. This is one. It could also include radiation. I didn't mention here, but it could also include radiation as well, very much, of course. So this convection and a conduction, the simultaneous consideration is an example or is a, is a good definition or is a decent definition, not a good, a decent definition of conjugated heat transfer. Uh, where does it occur? This occurs in lots of industrial practices, typically where there are some solid structures that are involved, solid structures. In this case, walls, the walls of the of the of the structure, uh, fins. When I use the word fins, probably you might have already started understanding that I hint about uh, heat exchanger because there is a fins. The the fins are involved here, and uh, these solid structures, when it interacts with the surrounding fluids, you have a combination of conduction and convection. Keep in mind that radiation is also a part of conjugated heat transfer as well, which I didn't mention here, but I have an example. I have a case study and I can tell you the radiation factor there as well. Okay, so for the for the uh, for the heat conduction in, in solids, so as I said, it is a simultaneous consideration of heat conduction in solids and heat convection in adjacent fluids. Let's look first into the heat conduction in the solids. We already know by now that that was the heat conduction equation that you have seen from the from the previous case with the Fourier's law. It governs how heat is transferred through the solid material, and of course the multiple parameters that are involved in this in this heat conduction are basically conductivity. Uh, uh, I, have, I have listed down here also conductivity there it's a density, specific heat, a temperature distribution and the time distribution. Temporal variation is the time, temperature variation and the temperature distribution within the solid. So these are these are uh, these are the parameters that are involved in this in this uh, in this uh, mathematical expression of heat conduction in the in the solid. Now this is the solid part. Uh, this is a conduction part of the solids. Now, we, as I said to you, the conjugated heat transfer involves both heat conduction and heat convection. So we also need to see what is happening in the heat convection as well. So um, the heat convection, as you know, or you may not know, is basically based on the very uh, useful equations of Navier-Stokes. So Navier-Stokes are the flow equations that are also since flow is an energy heat is also a sort of energy i have already explained to you in the in the in the couple of minutes ago so it describes it is described by the heat convection in fluid is described by the heat convection equation which is the navier stokes equation and uh, this uh, basically this this heat convection is the way how the heat is being carried by the moving fluid this fluid could be air, typically that is the case, air, or it could be for a heat exchanger, it could be a heat exchanger fluid, it could be a water, it could be something else, a, a fluid that basically has a good property to carry the heat, because the whole point is to be able to carry the, ca carry the heat from one point or one source to the other. So that's part of the convection, right? So this is the expression, and this expression basically uh, gives the relation between the thermal conductivity of the fluid with the temperature distribution and the and the velocity vector. So you see here that there is this additional term, the velocity vector. Uh, I have not used the vectorial expression, but it's okay, it doesn't matter. So this vectorial expression of this, um, the, of this uh, velocity vector is actually where the governing, uh, is, is where the, the Navier-Stokes equation is all about. So Navier-Stokes equation comes into play when you have a fluid velocity vector in the convection equation. So all good until now, we have heat conduction in solids and heat convection in fluids, but there is a little issue. The issue is that there is a, now a jump. There is a jump between the solid and the fluid, right? That's a critical thing. We talked about two separate blocks, okay? We talked about two separate blocks. Uh, these two separate blocks are basically about the solid and the fluid itself, but how to connect them? How to ensure that the fluid is uh, the heat is going from the solid to the fluid? That is the main thing about the conjugated heat transfer. So conjugated heat transfer in this case 
is important to realize as different from the other aspects of heat transfer is that you are now considering the transfer of the fluid by assuming that the temperature at the interface, at the interface, at the interface of what? At the interface between the solid and the fluid, that there is a continuity condition. This continuity condition is this. So this is very important that the temperature at the surface of the solid surface, at the, that is at the interface. So at the interface, temperature of the solid will be or has to be equal to the temperature of the fluid. This is a very important condition without which the interface interaction, uh, without which the, uh, this is a very important interface interaction condition without which the, uh, the conjugated heat transfer will not work. So this means that the mathematical uh, representation of the heat flux, uh, you may ask now yourself, you, uh, I'm, uh, there are some messages coming. Uh, why is there is no CP in the convective? Yeah, okay, uh, I, I get your part, but yeah, it's difficult. To, no, I cannot see the chat and when you're writing. So the CP, I assume the CP inside the inside the uh, lump parameter. So you're right, you, we can put, okay, <laughs> absolutely. It's okay, you, you can you can put the, uh, the CP part as well. It is a lumped parameter inside. So with the density, I didn't bother about that. You're right. So you know my answer now. Of course, uh, to be very explicit, we are in the research, we always lump some parameters, and in that case, I have, I have lumped the parameter, but you are right. If you put it in explicit form, indeed. So coming back to this interface. So this, uh, the, the interface uh, which I just mentioned about is the, is the which accounts for the thermal interaction uh, between the solid and the fluid domains. What does this actually does? This, uh, mathematically, this basically represents the heat flux, the heat flux, it remains smooth and consistent as it moves from the solid to the fluid domain. So this is very important. So this heat flux, if there is a jump in the heat flux, then your solution will never come correct. Okay, this is very, very important. And that's why using open source tools are very important where you can actually see what is happening and you can understand what is going on. So this continuity assumption is vital, very vital, very important for accurately modeling and simulating the heat transfer between the solids and the fluids. Most of the time, the mistakes comes because of this wrong interaction, uh, wrong assumption of the interaction that is being taken. So this, uh, this uh, uh, we engineers, uh, or you guys, when you will become engineer, you can use this approach to predict the temperature distribution, heat flux, and other critical thermal parameters relevant to design optimization such as durability and energy efficiency using this interface interaction. Very, very important point, as I, as I told you, keep that in mind, that this interface interaction is a very, very critical par parameter for handling a correct way of conjugated heat transfer. It's just an example of a conjugated heat transfer I just mentioned to you, convection and conduction. There is uh, more, much more to that. There is radiation involved. So now, since I have talked about conduction and convection, I'll try to show you some examples of analytical solutions of this conjugated heat transfer. Okay, so these are these are uh, these are some uh, available examples or available analytical solutions. And I have been telling to you that any numerical study or no numerical study is complete without an approach of analytical or at least pseudo analytical solution. So we uh, unfortunately because of the limitations of the mathematical uh, mathematics itself. We cannot go for, uh, we cannot go for, uh, they're very challenging. That's very sure. Analytical solutions are very challenging. And that's why this, this kind of analytical solutions are limited to very simplified geometry and simplified boundary condition. Of course, myself with my colleague, uh, we are pushing the limit of this analytical boundary and we are trying to get even solutions that are, do not have the standard uh, geometry and standard shape, you know, uh, and the boundary condition. Uh, we are trying to push that, but it is not easy because there is a big um, uh, there is a, a big gap for us as an engineer because that is where mathematics people are strong at. But mathematical people do not know the knowledge of engineering, so they cannot understand where the analytical solution would be added and for what implication. Anyways, so I collaborate with mathematicians from Turkey uh, and of course with Belgium. So try to get some mathematical analytical solutions are are very important. Let us now focus a little bit on this analytical solution. This is an analytical solution of a, of a heat conduction with convection for a thin plate. It's a thin plate conduction. As you can see here, 
that uh, uh, we use the uh, what we do here is that uh, we use the uh, uh, for yeah for any uh, thin plate conduction we start with uh, with uh, the using of the Fourier's law that is the basic for everything uh, with the heat conduction along with the convective boundary condition at the surface of the plate. So in that case we consider a thin plate of thickness L exposed to a fluid temperature of T ambient with a heat transfer coefficient of H on one side, and on the other side, of course, is insulated. You understand, otherwise it will, the solution is not proper yet. So the temperature distribution for this plate, this analytical solution does exist, and the temperature distribution within the plate, including the both conduction and convection factors, is actually the solution that is mentioned here. So this equation, that is T ambient plus T0 minus T ambient exponential of minus Hx over K, where uh, this this uh, this uh, uh, x is the distance, h is the the heat transfer coefficient, k is the thermal conductivity. You know all these things. So uh, you have the uh, the expression. This analytical expression is actually the expression at a distance x from the insulated boundary. From the insulated boundary, this is the expression that you can get. This expression, this equation uh, represents the uh, the temperature distribution uh, within the thin plate with convection, of course. And it shows how the uh, how the temperature uh, uh, varies with distance from the surface onto the plate, uh, taking into account both the conduction within the plate and convection at the uh, convective heat transfer, the convection at the surface of the plate. Okay, so this is this is a a, a good analytical solution that I can share with you. Uh, this analytical solution is quite useful. We use this kind of analytical solutions for. Uh, designing uh, certain engineering uh, object, engineering problems for certain for certain design uh, considerations, we use uh, such conditions where we are encountering such similar conditions, such similar condition of convection and conduction. We can use this as a good example of an analytical solution. Coming to another another uh, another uh, example, uh, this example is about uh, an infinite semi infinite solid. Uh, by the way, I want to be clear with you. So, do you understand what a? Do you know what a semi-infinite solid is? Uh, Any one of you? Do you know what a semi-infinite solid is? What exactly is a semi-infinite? Because before I keep on talking all these things, it is better to know what is the basic thing here. So, what is the? We are talking about a transient heat conduction in a semi-infinite solid with convection. So, what is a semi-infinite? What do you mean by a semi-infinite solid? Uh, you must have done your heat transfer, so you should be knowing this. Uh, can someone uh, write it or or if talk if you can? Semi infinite is basically it has a single surface, and uh, as you have mentioned here, uh, that it extends in all directions except one. So that's the the little mistake of me too. You have mentioned a single single surface extends in single plane surface indeed extends in all directions. That's the infinite. So semi infinite. Is uh, uh, is extending to infinity in all directions except one. So what happens is that if there is a kind of like a sudden change that is imposed to the surface, you will have this transient one-dimensional conduction that will happen within the solid. That's all. So good. I'm seeing that you, I see that you are you are all very active and very good. Sir, yeah. I have a question. So for this semi-infinite, so as we can see, mm -hmm. uh, temperature is a function of uh, one direction only. So a semi-infinite right. solid could be a body uh, which has only one dimension. Uh, so suppose uh, uh, in infinite length uh, rod. Infinite length rod. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the case. Indeed. Yes, mm. yes. Absolutely. So, so then, then how could you, then could how you, could, could you, it be plane two D? Sorry, no. It's a it's a conceptual plane. It's a conceptual plane. As I told you, mm. it's a it's a it has a single plane surface which is a conceptual. In a two D, it is a it's a single plane surface. But mm. if you consider it in the three D aspect, of course it has the of course these are conceptual things. Semi infinite solid does not exist in real life, as you know. So these are just some basic parameters to understand uh, the concept of the of the of the of the analytical solution. As you have correctly guessed, semi infinite solid is a is a conceptual uh, solid which is uh, kind of like a single plane surface extending to infinity in all directions except one. That's basically the idea. And if there is a sudden change that is happening to this one of these surfaces, there is the one dimensional conduction that will happen. So it's a very, very, very unrealistic reality, by the way, so let's put it like that. Um, so if you consider, if you consider the, the semi-infinite, let's say an example of the semi-finite solid, 
uh, we have uh, the analytical solution can be derived. Uh, in this case, the analytical solution needs to be used uh, the Laplace transform. I guess you have already done your Laplace transforms in your in your uh, in your mathematics, basic mathematics. And uh, if you remember this one-dimensional heat conduct conduction equation in a semi-infinite solid, look at the book of Incorpora. You will find there, I'm sure, uh, with this convective boundary condition at uh, uh, x equals uh, at x equals zero. You know, you have this dou square t over dou x square. I'm just telling by my mind, so I may be a little bit mistake here, but it's dou square t over dou x square. I think. Uh, equals to one over alpha and one over alpha is multiplied by dou t over dou x, right? Uh, dou t over dou t, sorry, dou capital T over dou small t. Uh, so this this is the main equation. And this equation, of course, you can solve it using this Laplace transform. Now coming back to the expression that I've written here, uh, if you had at t, time t equals zero, the surface of the solid is exposed to this uh, temperature ambient with the heat transfer coefficient h, and there is a temperature distribution that is happening between this, uh, uh, the temperature distribution that is happening between the zero and ambient uh, temperature, of course, for the direction, for the length of the, of the, of the semi-infinite solid. We can express this, ex we can express this condition by reading out, uh, by, by, by using this, uh, this equation. And this expression is very interesting because it has a, uh, it has an error function as well. So it's a, uh, it uses, as you see, it is not a direct equation. It's a little bit complex equation, which has a complementary error function. And this temp equation that you see here, uh, it relates the, the distance from the surface, the thermal diffusivity of the solid material, but also it is it is a it is um, it accounts for both the transient behavior of the conduction and um, and the con conduct conductive behavior. So uh, this paper that I've mentioned here, this paper basically discusses about that. So you can also have a look at this uh, this paper. Uh, uh, in the in later, I have just one more analytical solution. This is the one that I have uh, done with my students here a couple of uh, months ago. Here, this is a very complex problem, by the way. And I told you I'm a big fan of these analytical solutions. So uh, here, uh, what we have done is that we have uh, used an uh, because of the our problem that we had at, at hand, we use this uh, uh, concept of this long cylinder approach, uh, where we assume that the convective heat transfer is a constant. Initial temperature distribution is uniform along that radial direction. Expression is mentioned here. And we solve this actually using this kind of so-called Bessel functions. You already are aware of, you might be aware of a Bessel function. This is a very challenging problem, by the way. Very, this, this work has not been published yet. This is a challenging, uh, this was a very challenging problem. And we had to, my student actually, he solved the problem by this analytical solution by use the, the method of separation of variables. I don't know whether you are aware of this. This is a mathematical technique. Uh, she is a mathematician. Uh, so she uses the, 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 the separation of variables technique uh, in order to solve this resulting uh, ODEs, uh, which leads to this kind of complex equation. So this, was, this is a, a new uh, thing that we could give to the, uh, the scientific community for the heat transfer. This work has not yet been published because we are still working further on this area. Anyways, so uh, as we see here that this complex equation is only or can be only solved when we have a pseudo analytical. So this is not an exact analytical solution compared for the kind of geometry that we're looking for, but we use the similarity of long cylinder approach. And by that, we had this expression where we could use as a kind of like a, with using appropriate boundary conditions, we could use this, this work, okay? So it's a kind of like a, uh, let's say a mathematical simplification to the to the analytical solution to the real analytical solution that we could have expected. Okay, so now uh, having said all these stories about analytical solutions and uh, trying to encourage you all to I I I sincerely encourage you all to focus on analytical solutions. Uh, so uh, let's let's go to one of the numerical example of this uh, conjugated heat transfer in solar cooker. I took this example, guys, because first of all, you know, it's a very uh, interesting thing for us because this example is can be a very practical thing. I think more and more solar cookers are getting popular in in uh, our countries, for example, in India, also in Turkey, as I see here, because of the abundant sun. And uh, here, uh, just one interesting paper I want to discuss with you all. Uh, very very interesting. The, the paper was actually mm, you can you can uh, search the DOI. It's a recently. A published paper also from Indian authors uh, from Abhishek Sarangi and et al. Uh, 
Uh, they are from, uh, I see here, I've written down a note, uh, from the Odisha Institute of Tech, University of Technology and Research, Bhuvaneshwar, and they have collaborated with an Egyptian professor from Mansoura University. Uh, it's a very interesting problem and interesting solution that they have done uh, because uh, this solar cooker is a very common thing also in countries like, you know, the Maghreb region, Algeria, uh, Morocco, uh, Egypt, Libya, because of the sun. Uh, the solar cooker are getting more and more popular and also the off-grid, the way of off-grid life is getting uh, getting popular. So uh, for the for this paper, I'll go a little bit quickly now. So there has been a lot of papers on solar cooker, but this paper I found, they, this is not my paper, <laughs> just to be clear. Uh, this is Abhishek Sarangi's paper. So I, I, I really like this paper and I wanted to focus on this. So uh, this paper, they worked on Convective and radiative heat transfer. So it's not just convective anymore, uh, conductive, uh, not conductive, but convective and radiative heat transfer in the cooker active, in the cooker cavity. The cooker cavity is basically this one. If you can see here, the cooker cavity is this one. And they wanted to say what would be the optimal form, size, and shape of the solar cooker to gain the maximal heat transfer, obviously for the cooking purpose. Okay. So in this, uh, I'm gonna go a little bit quicker now. Uh, what they have done is that uh, they have uh, they considered the, the the heat loss caused by the radiation and laminar natural convection in a solar cooker uh, that has a rectangular and trapezoidal cavity. So that's basically this one, rectangular and trapezoidal. They considered four cases. I'll I'll come to that in the sl next slides. Uh, two possibilities were considered for the top wall. They considered cold wall and losses from the wind-induced convection and radiation. So wind-induced convection and radiation is one loss, and the cold wall is another another possibility. Okay, two possibilities for the top wall. Top wall is the most critical, as you understand. This is the top wall. This is the most critical one. Uh, so uh, the parameters of the heat loss in various depth cavities, and also they did a nice parametric study, a very clean and easy paper to understand their work. And and for me. It, it was very nice, very easily understandable. Uh, they also did the cavities flow pattern, isotherms. Now, I have some pictures of that, but this is the DOI. You can just note it down. Uh, you can print screen it, and you can look at yourself this paper in much more detail than what I'm presenting now. So uh, what we have done here is uh, there is an algorithm. Uh, they developed this, uh, or they proposed this algorithm. They proposed uh, the standard way of working. Uh, starting with the computational geometry and then this uh, this uh, four cases uh, one and three case one and three case one and three they are both a rectangular and trapezoidal and of course with the top boundary con a top wall boundary condition was isothermal as i told you before and the second and the fourth case second and the fourth case are this one where the air is non participating and they have a the uh, external heat transfer that is happening here okay so these are the four cases that basically they put into the model and they use, of course, they use ANSYS here. They don't use uh, open form. Uh, would be nice now if you guys can actually reproduce these results in the future uh, with open form. They use the solver. Um, I think the solver was uh, probably the simplex algorithm. And uh, uh, on this, they basically did the grid independent study, verification, and of course, finally, the nice parametric study in the results and the, the conclusion. Very, very nice and very easy paper for any first timer in conjugated heat transfer to st understand okay not very complicated at all so i have what is parametric study uh, parametric study means that you, for example if you have uh, certain parameters like length height you know you are very varying through the through the uh, i mean you are this is a phase of the design optimization so you do certain uh, changes in the length you do certain changes in the height you do certain changes in the shape, for example, aspect ratio. If you do all these changes, you have to do multiple simulations of different values of that. You understand me, right? So that is basically a parametric study. It's a kind of like... Uh, optimization. Yeah, optimization at the end, but you do what is called as the... Uh, let me remember the word. Design of experiment. You know, have you heard of this word? Design of experiment, DOE. Let me write it. Yes, sir. -E. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. So design of EO, design of experiment is actually uh, basically the parametric study. We always do these parametric studies before you actually uh, finalize a design. You know, before you finalize the design, you actually do this 
parametric uh, studies and of course the sensitivity study. That's so it. in design of experiment, uh, we have to do some, some sort of physical experiment or uh, simulation based? Yeah, that thing. is a good point. In the design of experiments, ideally, you should do physical experiments, you know, ideally. But as you yeah. know, these physical experiments are very expensive. So what we do is that we go in silico. We go to the computer. We reduce our design scope. You understand me, right? We reduce. So let's say we have 100 parameters in the problem. Let's assume. May not be the case, but let's assume. Now, these 100 parameters or 100 um, uh, par changes of these multiple values will take enormous money to do physically. So what we do is that we import this problem to the CFD software. In this case, uh, the open form, which will be open form for you guys. For me, I still work with ANSYS. So for me, ANSYS or, for example, Phoenix. And then I try to get the results. And these results for each of the, so there is a parameter, that, let's say parameter of length. And I have to vary between one to five centimeters. So for an increment of one centimeter each, I will have to design my experiment based on this length scale, which is changing from one to five. Am I am I clear? Actually, okay. are you able to understand? Yes, sir. So, so can't we use a non-dimensional parameter to obtain the results? No, yes, no, 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 no. You can't use that. No, and non non-dimensional parameter is only good question. Non-dimensional parameter is only done when you have optimized. But before optimization, your non-dimensional parameter will not give the correct result because you do not know it. You have to make your non-dimensional parameters, right? You have to have your non-dimensional parameters. But before you design something, it's a completely new system, for example, then you have to go through this design of experience. Once you optimized, then you have to do the scaling up. And the scaling up is typically done using the non-dimensional parameters. So non-dimensional parameters do not come in the first stage. They will come, of course, but they come in the later stage of your, uh, of your engineering problem. Okay. So these are this is the nice uh, this is the uh, this is the paper that uh, I'm I'm suggesting you guys to read if you are interested in conjugate transfer go through this paper very nice paper they have compared the radiative convective uh, radiative Nusselt number I think you already know by now what is a Nusselt number I don't have to remind you all it's a non-dimensional you just now mentioned that uh, Nusselt number is the ratio of the total heat transfer to the convective heat transfer you know this so this Nusselt number is a very important parameter to understand and as you can see here. Uh, understand this kind of uh, radiative convective uh, relations. And in this example, in, in this uh, answer, in this figure, this is for the case one and case three. If you remember, case one and case three, where one rectangular, one trapezoidal, with an aspect ratio of one. So the same aspect ratio uh, with an external temperature of one, external temperature ratio of 1.33. Uh, this is slightly a mistake. This is epsilon B. I'm sorry, this is a typing mistake. Uh, epsilon B is 0.1, that is the emissivity at the bottom surface. Uh, you see that the heat loss from the top wall is greater in the trapezoidal cavity than in the rectangular cavity for the same aspect ratio. That's uh, very interesting. Okay, so uh, these are the results for the isotherms. Um, uh, for again, for the uh, let me let me quickly check my note because I just printed it uh, yesterday. Yeah, this is also the first. Uh, I forgot to mention it here, guys. Apologies. So this case is uh, for the case one. Uh, this case is also for the case one. So this case is for the Rayleigh's number of 10 to the power 4. This case is for the Rayleigh's number 10 to the power 5. So it's a higher Rayleigh's number. Again, I assume that you know what is a Rayleigh's number. Uh, Rayleigh, R-A-Y-L-E-I-G-H, Rayleigh's number. It is, the, uh, uh, it, is a, it is a number that characterizes heat transfer in natural convection. So you know, you, you are aware of this, uh, that so below a certain critical Rayleigh's number, the, there is no convic convection, does not basically occur, and the heat transfer is through radiation. You, you know all these drills, so I don't want to go through this again. So this is an example, uh, this is a uh, uh, result from the, the isotherms, the heat isotherms for case one, uh, for the two different Rayleigh's number, and this is for the tra uh, square one, and this is for the trapezoidal one, for the same, for the exactly for the same Rayleigh's number, uh, uh, for the uh, for 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5, what is interesting to see here is that the isotherms are more packed at the along the bottom and the top walls. As you can see, they are more packed. The isotherms are more packed compared to this. And what does this mean? This means that that is very important for us. What does this mean physically? It means that there's a higher temperature gradient in that region resulting in significant heat transfer that is happening. So this means that your design of the system will be more optimal, probably with a more trapezoidal effect than with a square effect for the cooker. You know, that's a, something very interesting uh, that came out from uh, their study. Do look into their study for greater details. 
So this was the conclusion. I don't have uh, to read you all, uh, to read for you everything, because you have already the paper. They have done uh, a very interesting aspect ratio study, the NCVT study, the, the, the external uh, temperature ratio study. Uh, these are these are these are uh, this is beyond the scope of this uh, uh, of this presentation. But please go through this paper yourself uh, to understand what are the changes and you have done. And for me, this is a classic paper to approach a conjugated heat transfer. Okay, so now we are going through a little bit the last things of this conjugated heat transfer problem uh, presentation. Uh, there are some challenges uh, involved and some progresses has been done. Progresses has been done on the numerical techniques. I myself, I'm working on a numerical method, as I have told you before, that this is, these are these uh, analytical, pseudo-analytical is actually a numerical method, a kind of like a higher order numerical method that tries to improve the accuracy and efficiency of the solution. Uh, there is also machine learning applications that are, that are, that are going on. Uh, this, uh, these are typically called physics-inspired neural network. You, have might, you might have heard about this term quite often. And this is basically all about integrating the machine learning for optimization and prediction for the conjugated heat transfer problems. Coupling with fluid structure interaction, this is a, a very interesting work also. Some works are, some slow work is being done on this, not much. So these are all the research gaps that are, that are still existing. Uh, this coupling is so important in order to accurately measure that interaction that I talked about. And of course, the open source, you already are aware that you are in this workshop for this open source understanding that the whole idea of using the widespread use of physical knowledge is by using open source uh, platforms, in this case, open form. What are the challenges involved? Uh, challenges are, are computational complexity. Indeed, uh, it is not that easy to, uh, the time challenge is a big challenge for computational problems. This interaction jump is a, is a, is a time-consuming thing. So that's an issue. For that, the mitigation is efficient algorithm and some parallel computing. Uh, phase change, I didn't talk about that. Phase change is another issue, issue where we are using this, where we can use this phase change material, PCMs. And these uh, are actually adding complexity to the whole problem. Uh, one way, this is not the only way, one way of mitigating this problem is to accurately represent the latent heat effects. FSI I've already talked about, uh, the transient heat analysis. Yeah, this is also very important because most of the time our heat transfer solutions are steady state. And actually that is not accurate. So to avoid the mistake, we need to change to time dependent solution. And the time dependent solutions are actually very challenging in terms of the transient you know, the, net, the general nature of transient, it's a, a very chaotic solution. You cannot understand whether you have uh, reached, um, uh, you, whether you have reached, uh, you know, the convergence or not. And these are real challenging. I myself have been facing this a lot. So I know these are big issues. One way of uh, overcoming this time independent, uh, time dependent problems is actually to use some kind of uh, higher numerical methods. Again, my solution is to come back to analytical solution. If your analytical solution gives a result and you say that, yes, more or less the results are correct, then you can accept your numerical result. Otherwise, it is very difficult to accept such numerical results. Discipline optimization, I think I've talked about this when you have multidisciplinary, you know, thermal, structural, fluid, and let's not make life complicated. So uh, these are big challenges, actually, big challenges. And these are the real challenges. Uh, when you when you when you want to uh, study something on a on an industrial scale, of course, it is a multidisciplinary optimization problem. Uh, in that case, in in one case, you may have thermal structural and fluid dynamics uh, problems as well. Convergence issues I have already explained. So that's all, guys, from my side. Okay. Uh, hello, Professor. Hi. Okay. In slide number eight, you have explained about the continuity condition. Uh, between the interface interaction. So my question is, uh, like when T is uh, temperature of the solid is equal to temperature of fluid. Okay, what happened when the temperature of solid is more than the temperature of fluid? Example, let's take a plate of heated at uh, 100 degrees Celsius and uh, uh, air is flowing at 25 degrees Celsius. So is there no interface between both of these? Because this condition is not going to satisfy, right? No, it is not going to satisfy. So what you have to do here, this is a problem. Uh, I know, and these are very practical problems. Here, uh, because you are going to do these numerical uh, issues, you know, you will be coming to these numerical issues. Other, the one easy solution is to, you will have this, you have to live with this jump, this temperature jump, but this is not okay. correct. 
So what you, the other solution is to actually refine your grid, you know, as much oh. as possible, so okay. that you can touch the boundary layer. And this is one one option. But you know, this makes your problem very very complex in terms of time. And I've been giving this. Uh, I've been mentioning this in my in my later slides, as you have said. So this is one problem. There is a um, there is a there is a. Uh, uh, one professor from Cambridge, uh, Louis Liu He, I think his name. I have his paper with me because you know it's currently I'm working with all these things. Uh, he has been working on this interface interaction problem, and actually he sent me one paper, um, conjugated heat transit. It's a review paper he just recently wrote. Um, it has been just published in uh, last uh, month, I think. Uh, he's discussed about. He mentioned to me that he has discussed about this in his in his review paper. Uh, he's from uh, Department of Engineering Science, uh, Cambridge, Oxford University. Sorry, not Cambridge, Oxford. Um, it would be nice if you could send me an email. I could uh, send you this document. Uh, sure. You can sure. look into that. It's a serious problem. No, there's no doubt about it. Sure, sure. Yeah. So another thing on this uh, interface thing. So what if this interface between the solid and fluid also has a heat generation? Can we? Is there a solution for this? Wait, wait. Let me understand. The solid and the fluid interface has heat generation. So we have a patch on the yeah. solid that is producing yeah. heat and uh, air is yeah. flowing on this. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So in that case, you have to model that as well, right? Otherwise, uh, if it's a heat gen, I think uh, uh, Harish uh, presentation is going to be on that. Uh, he has a uh, heat generation issue. So I guess, or, or if I understand correctly, are you having heat generation at the interface or or, or where actually? So exactly uh, on the interface. So the, the solid fluid interface, the boundary, the the boundary mm -hmm. has a heat generation. So how will mm -hmm. that work with this? Uh... So what you need to do is basically take a lumped condition. You know, you take the solid as a completely heat generating uh, heat source unit instead of the interface. I I don't know myself to be so honest. We, basically, we should go done. for volume. We should go for volume heat generation and have a, a interface outside yes. that volume. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. That is the that is, again it's a again it's a limitation. Eh? By the way, it's a huge assumption. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, that is the solution as of now, indeed. Yeah, no, good question. Thank you. Okay. Sir, okay so okay. I have yeah. I have tried uh, that interface problem that uh, he just suggested, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have tried that. So, but can that you requires... share your experience, please, John? That would yes, be great. Uh, so, in that case, then we have to look at the effusivity of the two fluids, right? And then whatever heat is being added at the interface will be shared by both the solid and the like if it yeah. is a heat source. So mm -hmm. then whatever, suppose if uh, on one side of the interface is a solid, on the other side of the interface, you have liquid, right? Then uh, that interface, whatever heat you are adding as a flux gets distributed okay. between the solid and the liquid. And so that is equally distributed, distributed or, or, no, no, or no, is no, no, in terms no. of distribution will depend upon the effusivity. So you effusivity. have to look that up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that you have to look it up. So then you can maybe, you know, decide how much is going in. Because you start your simulation from there and then you compute the uh, flux and then the balance should be there. Right? Whatever you are supplying, Good kx, dx, Good that way. Huh. And the, the distribution you. is dependent upon the properties of the fluid, uh, fluid and the solid. So if you just work it. it out by considering this, I think you will. It be is a kind to... of like a fluid structure interaction that you are suggesting now. It's a kind of like an FSI actually. So I, I get your point. Uh, do you, have you published this work, John? Is, is it possible to uh, read it? Then you can share it also with uh, with us. Uh, me at least. I have not published, sir, but I was uh, okay. I was modeling something. Hmm? Okay. I was model modeling something, so that is when I did this. So this is uh, yeah. okay. I uh, this uh, there is one analytical work on this that is done by Sue et al. Uh, and I did that numerically, so I wrote my own code. So that time I had mm. handled this. Mm. So this sort. So uh, this generally they do when say you have an interface, you have a solid sub substrate over which you have a thin thin film heater, and then you have water above. So the heat that is generated okay. within the heater will go to both the substrate. Okay. Yeah, that is a practical uh, example. So that uh, thin film that is getting heated, it will uh, transmit heat both to the solid as well as the water. And that uh, bifurcation uh, it depends upon what is the property of uh, the solid material and the property of water. Okay. Perfect. So you Thank can, you. You can look Thank that you. up. Thank you for sharing this experience. Okay. This is very vital. As you know, this is an ongoing research. So yes, nothing yes, is... Sir. Uh, finalized yet, but this interaction is a big problem for the conjugated heat transfer issues, and I have been facing it a lot. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, John. Yeah. Okay, so Thank Madam Mukherjee, I think uh, I will uh, leave now. Okay, okay, that is not a problem, Dr. Dutta. Thank okay. you so much for this uh, exciting session. <laughs> I hope all Thank of you, you all, all of them, has uh, you know have 
been benefited immensely and also the interactive session was very fruitful for them yes i i would i focused on this because it is there all students and they all have questions and this is important to under, answer them and not every question i have an answer so this is also yes, important yes. to learn what i do not know as well it's exactly. a huge learning for me as well thank you thank you guys so much bye bye